we'll be looking after this. So what we'll be discussing in our slides, we'll be discussing what is gut microbiota, what is its role, how, what does this gut dysbiosis means, and what are the factors which are affecting the gut microbiota, and how gut microbiota affects the brain functioning, and what is gut brain axis, or what we can say, what is the connection between the gut and the brain, and how it is related. So a brief introduction about what are uh, gastrointestinal symptoms means? What are the most common GI abnormalities? See, uh, GI uh, abnormalities are very, very common in patients who are on the spectrum. It is said that we know that associated problems of comorbidities, which may be anxiety, which may be OCD, which may be behavioral issues, which may be gut issues. There are so many issues which are associated with autism, which we call it as comorbid conditions, means the associated problems which are not the core features, whereas sensory issues, verbal speech and language, communication issues, these are considered to be the core features of autism. But besides the core features of autism, there are some associated problems. And those associated problems are like most important one is gut problems. And gut problems is believed to be associated in around 35 to 40% of kids who are on the spectrum. So irrespective of the severity of the gut problem, it has been found that there are a lot of problems which happen in the gut in children of autism. So why this uh, problems of gut happens in children in autism, we'll figure it out that and also we'll see how it is related to the issues in autistic child. So many studies have found that there is an alternation in the composition of the fecal flora. Fecal flora means we have good and bad bacteria in our stomach. It is present in all the human beings. So they have to live in a harmony. The balance between the good and the bad should always be maintained so that they remain in harmony. But it's not possible that any one of them should take a dominancy. If the good bacteria take the dominancy, it can create a problem. And if uh, bad bacteria take a dominancy, it again can cause a problem. So they have to remain in equilibrium. So what the studies have found that this equilibrium between the good and the bad bacteria is very much disturbed in the gut of the autistic children. And why it is disturbed, we will be seeing, but this is the main, uh, I would say, the culprit or the problem which is there in the gut. And because of this disbalance between the composition between the good and the bad, all the problems of the gut happens. Now, why this problems of the gut is associated with the problems of the brain in autistic children, that will be also seeing that. So the gut microbiota influences the brain development in many ways. So how this gut composition is related to the brain, because, you know, we know about the brain. We know that brain is also known as central nervous system. Many of us might have heard of this term. But there is also a system what is known as enteric nervous system. Enteric means intestines. The word enteric is derived from the word intestines or the gut. So there is a brain or we can say that it's called as a small or the mini brain of the uh, body. So the mini brain of the body, what is called as the gut. This mini brain is connected to the main brain or called as the central nervous system or the connection between the gut and the brain. And this is connected through a lot of tracks. And those tracks can be either due to chemicals, like we must have heard about, uh, you know, inhibitory neurotransmitters, excitatory neurotransmitters, GABA, glutamate, so and so we might have heard about that. So this is a connection through the chemicals then through the autonomic nerve. Autonomic means through the nerves. So connection is between through the chemicals, through the nerves, and through the immune pathway. Immune pathway means children who are very much, we might have also observed that children who are on the spectrum, they are more frequently get allergic manifestations compared to neurotypical children. Yeah, frequently cough and cold, or sneezing, yeah, they have to take a regular course of antibiotics after just a seasonal change. So that is the immune pathway. So the mini brain or the gut is connected to the brain through these three channels. And the problem is because of these three channels, there is a problem between the connection between the gut and the brain. And that is the whole crux and that is the whole idea of the connection between the gut and the brain. And it is not only related to autism, it is related to many other developmental problems. It might be uh, schizophrenia, it might be ADHD, but yes, because autism is the most growing neurodevelopmental disorder in children, and uh, the, just to quote out the figures, in 2000, in, uh, in, uh, maybe in 2004, in 2002, as per the CDC, that is Center for Disease Control, the prevalence of autism was 1 in 65. 
but as per 2016 census, the prevalence has increased to one in 35. So you can see how rapidly this autism is being progressing. And because of that, it is considered to be the most, you know, fastest growing neurodevelopmental disorder in children. So that is why the, all the focus and research, the research is being more focused on autism rather than any other neurodevelopmental disorders. So this association has also been found to in others like ASD and many other like inflammatory bowel, which is related to adults. So we are not concerned with that. So our topic is confined to ASD today. So how this GI link uh, came into autism? Association of GI problem. GI means cut. So in 1943, uh, Leo Kenner, he was a gastroenterologist. And he did a study and he found that six out of 10 children with autism presented with uh, severe feeding difficulties. And what he found in his study, it is way back in 1943 when nobody was aware of these terms. In during that period, what he found that the problem of these feeding difficulties was much more higher in case of ASDs compared to development delay children compared to neurotypical. So you can see that how the proportion of these difficulties was much, much higher in ASD compared to development delays and compared to a neurotypical child. But unfortunately, not very much research was done during that time. But yes, the problems of these autism associated with gut problems was much, much there way back in 1940s. But because of the more awareness among the professional parents and social media, we are now aware and these problems have now been well understood and has been very much aware with the different uh, you know group of people maybe parents but earlier it was not there though the problems were still persisting so why study why we want to study gut in autism the most important logical reason is there are some things which are there in autism which we cannot correct we know that there are some defective brain connections what we say defective wiring system or if i use the word technical term synaptic pruning if many of many of the parents must have attended my previous webinars where I have discussed about synaptic pruning. A, there is a very important question which comes in our mind that why children on autism appear to show features of autism only at the age of two to three years. Why not they don't show the features of autism whenever they are immediately they are born? Why it is that my child up to the age of two years is absolutely fine, then suddenly after a dose of MMR or after a dose of some viral infection, antibiotic course, he suddenly lands up and goes into regression, what we now use the term autism regression, that immediately his social milestones, speaking, language, Sara Oska suddenly chala gaya. Why has that happened? What that thing, uh, uh, you know, shoot up in the mind that caused the autism? There is no such thing. The problem was already there in the body. It was there well before the child is born. But the problem is the concept of synaptic pruning develops at the age of two to three years. Now, I'll just give you a brief about what is synaptic pruning. You know, when a child is born, there are a lot of unwanted connections are there in the brain. It's just like zigzag. Connections are going like this. So as a result, you might have observed when you give some command to a maybe 10 month old child or a one year old child, he may not be able to follow that. He might be just looking here and there. What is being told to them as though there are so many commands are coming. That means there are so many unwanted connections. But when the child starts growing, by the age of two to three years, synaptic pruning starts and it continues till the age of five to six years. Synaptic pruning means those unwanted connections, zigzag connections which are there, they get replaced. That means to say distance gets replaced, only displacement comes. Displacement we have studied in physics, the shortest and the straight path. Distance can be here and there that way. So to uh, make your body logic, to make your body think logically, and faster and process faster, you would always choose a displacement path rather than a distance path. So this is the natural gift which has been given by God that during the age of five to six years, the synaptic pruning happens in the brain. That is the neuronal connections which are there in the brain. They go in a form of displacement means they choose the shortest and the best pathway between the different neurons. As a result, unwanted connections go away. That is why by a child reaches the age of five years, seven, 10, his processing becomes very fast. He will immediately respond to you within a second, though he might not have responded to you when he might be a two-year-old child. But why this thing happens in a child when he is five to six years, where again, you just a simple command, go to the kitchen and bring a glass of water will be like, you are giving him so much over empowerment to his brain that he becomes oversensitive. He might not be able to understand that command. He might feel what has been told to him, whether it is a German, whether it is a French. So you start performing discrete trial treatment. Means, ek ek command, ek ek bar mein doge. Achha, kitchen mein jao. Gilas leke ao. Why you are telling? Because on those kids, synaptic pruning doesn't happen. 
means those unwanted connections which are there in the brain which is present in the child when the child is born are still present in the child when he is up to the age of 5 to 6 years so that is the problem that why all these symptoms of socialization skills loss of language skills and everything appears at the age of 2 to 3 years so that is the crucial period where synaptic pruning happens unfortunately it autism it doesn't happen now we say that adhd has a better prognosis than autism why because in adhd there is also synaptic pruning issues there but there is delayed synaptic pruning delayed synaptic pruning means unwanted connections hat jate hain displacement ban jati hai but wo delayed hoti hai ek agar 6 saal ke bacche mein honi chahiye wo ek 10 saal ke bacche mein ho jati that is why adhd has a better prognosis in the sense they are better adapted to the environment than compared to autistic children why because in autism synaptic pruning doesn't happen although it might happen with lot of uh, therapies it's it, there is no such term doesn't happen means it is very much delayed and also depending upon the severity whether it is mild to moderate or severe that effect of synaptic pruning may pro, uh, may produce the result on the child so this is one thing now these are the things which we cannot work but in situ, but on the gut we can work because we have seen there is a connection between the gut and the brain if the gut is bad the brain functions also get disturbed because of the release of bad chemicals and everything so we feel that now our approach for uh, you know managing autism is most towards healing gut because we have found if we are able to heal the gut the symptoms of autism becomes better because bad gut increase the symptoms of autism in a very simple way you might have observed in your child when he is having lot of issues of constipation bloating uncontrolled laughter humming that is yeast overgrowth issues his cooperation level his anxiety levels his focus his cooperation his sensory issues might shoot up when his guts get settled down either maybe by a gfcf diet or maybe an etc xyz reason that we are not discussing but when his gut becomes settled you might have observed that his cooperation level his sensory his behaviors his sleeping patterns get settled so that is what that is why our focus now turns directly towards healing the gut rather than working on the core features automatically the core features will settle down if we are able to work on the autism i mean the gut so these are the i have taken the studies across 140 this is the largest study which has been done related to gi or the gut problems in autism so they have taken the median studies across 144 autism uh, studies what they found that constipation was 22% diarrhea was 23% abdominal pain was 14 bloating nausea and any symptom etc so that means the major crux is being uh, dominated by the constipation diarrhea and abdominal pain and yes in my clinical practice also i have seen these are the major problems which we face along with the yeast overgrowth issues which might come out in the form of bloating uncontrolled laughter humming excessive disturbance in the sleep so why this why we want to study this human gut and you would be fascinated to know that human gut is is uh, is dominating our body rather than we as a uh, human being you know the weight of the uh, our dna compared to the gut dna gut dna means the microbes which are present it is 1/10 our dna is just 1/10 of the microbe dna so it's just like we are more of a bacteria than the human body so you would be imagine that there are approximately 9.9 million different types of uh, you know microbiotas or the genes are present so that is why any factor external factor which may affect the gene expression of these dnas or the microbes or the microbiotas it can directly affect our uh, i mean it can directly affect our gut so the just to make you uh, understand that the Uh, the proportion of the host dna is just 1/10 that of the bacterial dna so we are just more of a bacteria than the human body so just a brief about these terms because we should understand what these terms means because we do study a lot about these terms so what these terms means micro micro ka matlab bas yahi hota hai there are different microorganisms which are present in the human body we have talked about good bacteria we have talked about bad bacteria so micro means just the microorganism which are present in the body now what does this microbiota means microbiota means the different microorganisms which are bad or good collection of all these is called microbiota now microbiome means the genetic material like we as a human body we have a genetic material we have genes which represent our body phenotypically or genotypically phenotypically means jaisa hum dikhte hain agar hamari genes hum bolte hain na ki meri shakal iski shakal iski mummy pe hai his looks appearance to that of the father why because their genes he has adapted the genes from the father or the mother that is why he is looking that way 
Similarly, there are genes in the microbe which represent themselves how they appear. So that is known as genome or the microbiome. The collection of all these genetic material is known as microbiome. So this microbiome, that is the genetic material of these microbes, whether it is a bad or good, is greatly influenced by our thinking, by our thought, by our diet, hygiene, and as well as our genes. So that is why it is very, very important that we should maintain ourselves in a very good, healthy lifestyle because any stress which our body bears will indirectly pro provide stress to the genetic material of that microbes. And as a result, they might cause a disturbance in the body. That is why we might observe whenever we have anxiety or exam-related stress, the first common thing which happens is the problem with the gut. That is the reason. So now, what is the role of the gut of microbiome? Now, there are uh, gut microbiome, I have told you, the genetic material of different types of bacteria which are present. They are very, very important for us because there are good bacteria also, as I have told you. So those good bacteria play a very important role in providing vitamins and nutrients to our body. They help in, you know, they help in preventing us from a lot of uh, infections, frequent cough and cold, gut problems, diarrhea. They also help in regulating our you know, gut in the sense they will help in maturing the gut they will help in providing a better connection between the gut and the brain so that bad toxins do not go to the brain. As a result, they help in maintaining our behavior because, you know, our emotions are connected through our gut. It's uh, very practically we might have observed. As I've given you an example, in case of we might feel, you know, exam related stress, we might go, the child might go into constipation or some children because of exam related stress may go into diarrhea. So this is because our emotions are connected with the gut. And that is why this gut and brain connection is very, very important. That means indirectly it influences the behaviors. And that is the problem which happens in children who are on the spectrum with high gut issues. Now, gut issues not only means that they will have problems with gut. That means uh, they will be having problems of uh, constipation, diarrhea, bloating. No, it's much beyond that. They can express their emotions. They might be problems with the expression of emotions. We know that children on spectrum, they have a lot of problems with self-regulation or what we call as dysregulation of emotions. They are not able to understand the emotions of us themselves, forget about understanding the emotions of others. So that is why we talk about self-awareness and social awareness. That all is related to the problems with the cut. It is one of the theories. It is not that that is the only problem. There are other theories related to sensory that is, the sensory system is not very well developed. So these are different school of thoughts which are coming nowadays in order to work on the problems of autism. But this is something which we can be work medically through the nutrition, biprobiotics, and etc. But other things, they need to be worked with the conventional approaches of therapies. So what is dysbiosis? Now, this is a technical term. We don't have to go into that. Dysbiosis means the disbalance between the good and the bad bacteria. So we know that there is a harmony between the good and the bad. They have to remain in balance. If either of them goes up and down, there is a problem. And that is the problem which causes the problem or the whole worsen the problems or the poor features of autism. That doesn't cause, but it worsens the problems. And along with that, this dysbiosis causes a problem what is known as leaky gut. Now, leaky gut is a very common term, which I believe 90% of the parents might revere that in relation to autism. Leaky gut in a simple way means... Uh, 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 I think there is no diagram in this slide. Otherwise, I would have shown you leaky gut. Just a minute. Yeah, this is the diagram. So leaky gut means now these are different. These are the you know this is this is the gut. Now gut is connected. There are different linings, or you can say there are different cells in the gut. This is the gut like this. So they are connect interconnected like this. But what happens when there is dysbiosis? Dysbiosis means the bad bacteria goes up and the good bacteria goes down. This connections or the con uh, connections between the gut loses. So as a result, there is a gap happens. Now, because of this gap, the bad bacteria goes into the gut. And when they goes into the gut, they go into the brain through the blood vessels or through the connections between the gut and the brain. Now, these bad bacteria, when they go, they causes neuroinflammation. Neuroinflammation means swelling of the brain. And because of that swelling of the brain, all these features of, you know, hyperactivity, aggression, worsening of sensory issues, sleep disturbance can happen. And though, what are those toxins that is beyond our topic? These are tumor factor and alpha. That is uh, purely for the professional uh, talk. But for us to understand, they release the toxins. And when they release the toxins, they affect the brain through this connection between the gut and the brain axis. Now, what is the thing that can cause 
increase in the bad bacteria. Yes, we have heard that yes, there is a balance between the good and the bad, but what is the thing or what is that, you know, trigger which causes the increase in the bad bacteria, specifically in children of autism? Why not in others? In others also, it can cause a problem, either due to the use of drugs, foods, and etc. But that is transient. Whereas autism is not transient. It is a problem which is, you know, it is the problem of the, during the process of formation, I would say, of the brain. So that problem can happen well before the child is born. So what are those problems? The first and foremost problem is how about the mental thinking of the mother during the pregnancy? Now, the first nine months, the nine months of pregnancy are very, very important. Why? Because during that period, the mother might have bad obstructive history, means complications during delivery. He might have taken, she might have taken a lot of antibiotics. She might have uh, having severe urinary tract infection. She might have taken uh, maybe some seizure problems or they might be having some stress. That is emotional stress, not physical, emotional stress, either due to job, related to family, related to financial. So this stress, all these factors can affect the expression of the genes of the mother. Now that expression of the genes of the mother can affect the expression of the genes of the microbiota or the gut or the bacteria which are present in the mother. Now mother is conceived, child is there in the uterus. So whatever stress is there in the mother, it can affect both to the child. So as a result, it can influence the expression of the genes in the gut of the fetus. Fetus means when the child is there in the mother. So these are the factors which can happen well before the child is born. Now, what are the factors which happen during the birth? The mode of delivery. The child who is delivered by cesarean section, the chances of going into autism is much, much higher compared to the child who has been born to normal delivery. Now said that doesn't mean that every child who is born through cesarean section will land up into autism. No is always we talk about the probability. The probability of going into autism increases. It doesn't mean that a child who is developed, who is delivered by a normal delivery will not go into autism. No, that is why I'm using the word, the chances of going into autism increases by cesarean section. I hope I've made myself clear. So why it is that? Because when the child is born through the cesarean section, the bacteria which are being delivered into the gut of the child are bad. Whereas when the child is born through the normal delivery, the bacteria which are delivered into the gut, because child there is a connection between the gut and the uh, mean the child between the mother through the uh, umbilical cord which we cut after the birth. So till the cord is not cut, anything which is there in the mother, either the good or the bad bacteria can transfer. So that is the thing. When it is delivered through the good uh, cesarean section, bad bacteria get transferred into the gut of the child, and when it is delivered through the normal, good bacteria get transferred. That is why the probability increases. Other factors can be, as I've told you, antibiotics, mother, stress of the mother. We use the word epigenetics. Epigenetics means the environmental stress, which is causing the uh, effect, which is uh, affecting the expression of the genes. So if you are uh, nowadays, this environmental stress, this mental stress is much more causing problems than physical stress. And there was a study recently done by United States of America and Texas University, where they have compared the physical stress related to mental stress in modifying the expression of the genes of microbiota in the gut of the child on spectrum, they found that more than 50% of the parents who, whose child land up in autism were having more mental stress than physical stress. So this is the importance of epigenetics and keeping our mind good, having a good, healthy, nutritious diet and being relaxed. And that is why, you know, there is an old saying by our ancestors, actually, this is very true. This is actually very true. So now what is dysbiosis? I have shown that there is a disbalance between the good and the bad bacteria. So this is a very simple diagram to make us understand even better. So these blue, on the left side, these are the bifidobacteria and the lactobacilli. These are the good bacteria, which should always remain in our gut. But unfortunately, due to X, Y, Z reasons, which we have discussed previously, and now see on the right side, how much uh, the, uh, the incidence of the, the, I mean, the proportion of these good bacteria reduces drastically. Whereas the proportion of the bad bacteria like Candida, Klebsiella, etc. and etc. All those different colors which you are seeing, these are all bad bacteria. The good bacteria were only green and the blue, the rod shape. They are all decreased in the right side diagram. Why? Because of the dysbiosis. And so what are the factors which are affecting? I have told you this reason. One is called as a maternal diet, which I have told you. That is, you should have a balanced diet. Along with that, if the mother is not taking iron supplements, you might have heard that once the mother gets pregnant, the gynecologist tells them, 
or the obstetrician tells them to take iron regular, to take calcium regular. Why? To avoid taking smoke, avoid smoking, avoid alcohol consumption. Why? Because it can indirectly affect your health and can indirectly affect the child's health. So that is why consumption of good amount of iron calcium is very important. So factors affecting the gut. Another thing I have told you that is a uh, mode of delivery, whether it is a cesarean or a normal. Because in normal delivery, good bacteria are being transferred, whereas in bad uh, cesarean section, bad bacteria get transferred. And these, for them, all the studies have been done. And I have mentioned you the specific strains also. But this is beyond our topic. For us to understand, uh, the take-home message should be chances of going into uh, chances of going into the probability of going to autism is higher when the child is born through cesarean section. So another important factor is breastfed versus formula fed. Nowadays, because of the you know lifestyle, job stress, or maybe most of our uh, mothers are also professional nowadays. So all these factors has now uh, causes the shifting of the formula fed rather than going for the exclusive breastfeeding. Now we say, you might have heard your pediatrician might be saying, a child should be going for exclusive breastfeeding. Exclusive breastfeeding means he should be only given breastfeed for the first six months of life. No water even should be given, no cow milk. Unfortunately, even the educated mothers are going for the cow milk, buffalo milk, even at the age of two to three months. Because probably because of the guidance by the grandparents, because earlier they used to give. But uh, maybe awareness was not there. But we say that exclusive breastfeeding should be done. But unfortunately, because of the lifestyle stress, childs are being without, uh, you know, unknowingly, unknowingly, I would say, they are now shifting to the formula feeds. Now, when they are shifting to the formula feed, the bad bacteria goes into the body because they have less amount of lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. And I have talked about HMOs. If some of the, uh, I have discussed about HMOs also previously, and our clinic is also doing a study on HMO. We are doing a research paper on HMO. HMO is a prebiotic. And why we consider, why we insist on going for the breast feeds? Why? Because they contain HMO. HMO is called human milk oligosaccharides. It's a peculiarity of the human milk. It is present only in the breast milk. And it contains some specific uh, strains. And uh, not strains, it contains, it, it has a structure in similar manner that it promotes the growth of good bacteria like lactobacillus and bifidobacteria. Whereas other components of prebiotics like inulin, which we know, they do not promote the growth of good bacteria. They promote the growth of both good and bad bacteria, while HMOs promote the growth of good bacteria only. So that is why it's the importance of giving exclusive breastfeeding in first six months of life. Now, the good thing is HMOs are now available commercially also, not in India, but in US. Other factors, now this is the Indian study which has been done by AIMS and it has been published in uh, maybe I think 2011 it was published and what they found that the children who were on the spectrum, they fecals, their uh, stools were containing very uh, low amounts of good bacteria like bifidobacteria and lactobacillus. Whereas children who were on, uh, just give me a second please. Sorry for the interruption. So this was a study which was done by Ames, and what they found that children who were uh, who were uh, children who were on the spectrum ASD, their gut was consisting of more of bad bacteria, and whereas children who were neurotypical, they were containing more of good bacteria. So the uh, the results reveal that microbial dysbiosis is very common in association with ASD. So this is the evidence of role of gut microbiota that these are the different studies I have quoted, so we don't have to go into the details. And this is just, you make you understand the hypothet uh, hypothes hypothetical diagram of what we have discussed in our previous slides. So uh, considering the maternal immune activation. Now maternal immune activation means when the child is there in the womb, mother is taking some antibiotics, mother is under stress, mother is not taking iron uh, calcium supplementations. So this causes the stress in the mother. Now, because of the stress in the mother, there is an activation of the immune system in the mother. Because of that activation of the immune system, it causes a lot of you know, toxins in the body. 
Now those toxins, because mother is conceived, so those toxins with the specific bad bacteria which are there, they go into the child's gut. And when they go into the gut, they can increase the probability of going into the spectrum depending upon the mode of delivery and other factors. So it is now said that the thing is, you know, you can see now that the formation of uh, precursors for the autism is formed well before the child is born. You know, uh, it has been already stated there, the conditions has already been created in the first five to seven months of life when the mother is conceived because of the stress or X, Y, Z factors that the child may land up into autism. But, or if not during the delivery mode, maybe due to the X, Y, Z factors which we have decided or discussed. But the presentation of the child only happens at the age of two to three years. Why? Because till the age of two to three years, we might say, chal bol ni ra, koi baat nahi. Dela, uh, delay hai, speech delay hai, school nahi ja ra, COVID times hai. He might go, he might interact. He's the only child in the family. So he might not interact. Just wait for another three months. My child, that child started speaking when he joined to the school. So we all think, we don't want to, you know, it's like, because most of the things, if the child is in the mild to moderate, many of the things will be there. He might have good eye contact. The only problem which brings us to the doctor is speech and language delay. Bol nahi ra, bol nahi ra. Even at the age of three to four years, if he would have been speaking, believe me, even if a child would have been speaking by the age of three to four years, if there would have been no eye contact, if he would have been throwing things, we would not be worried much. We would be saying, okay, theek hai, zada tantrum throw karta hai. He is the only child. Parents, grandparents, but pamper But he is speaking. So everything is fine. Because for us, socially, the thing is speaking. Agar yehi bacha nahi bol tha, then we would go to the doctor. And still, then the whole problem and investigation comes and then comes up to the land of the problem that child is in the ASD. But there was no such problem. Child was absolutely fine. He was uh, well, uh, delivery was normal. He was good birth weight weight. Then why he landed up? So why he landed up? There are no uh, questions for that. It's only the probability of landing up into autism. But yes, now is the thing is, there are some definite approaches where we can work with the child on autism. Approaches, not treatment. So what is gut-brain axis? Having said, discussed behind the background of all these gut-brain axis, and what is this gut-brain axis? Again, the gut-brain axis, the connection between the gut and the brain, which is connected with three important parameters, which I have told you. One is through the nerves, one is through the chemicals, another is through the emotions, that is the hormones. If your emotions is good, your brain will be good. It's just like, I'm having a lot of gut problems. I'm having constipation. My gut will tell, I'm having, I'm in, I'm in problem. I won't, I will also keep you in problem. So the small, uh, there is always a tussle between the uh, big brain and the small brain. That is the gut and the brain. So it will tell, I'm, I'm uh, feeling uncomfortable. I'll also make you uncomfortable. And if the brain is uncomfortable, that will make the small brain uncomfortable. So this is how the connection is there. And that is why, and we have taken this theory in modifying the features of autism, that is through working on the gut. So this is the diagram which is there, just to make us understand that this is the intestines and this is the upper part is the brain. This is the brain and below is the gut. So this is how they are interconnected. So these toxins which release, we are not going to the details of the toxins, but the only thing is that whenever these uh, toxins are released through the leaky gut, leaky gut can happen as we have discussed. So they can cause to the brain, they reach the brain, they cause inflammation in the brain and ultimately they reduces the synaptic pruning. I was using the word synaptic pruning. This is the problem which happens when all these toxins. So the whole problem starts with the gut, the brain and ultimately causing the problem in synaptic pruning. So if anyone have, uh, so if anyone of you was following Nemichek protocol or have heard about Nemichek protocol, Dr. Nemichek tells about propionic acid. He tells that we should give a course of antibiotic. If faxipin is the name, if, uh, if actually someone has followed that protocol. And he, uh, Dr. Nemichek tells us to give this uh, rifampicin for 15 days. Now, the reason behind he tells that because propionic acid is, uh, you know, is a short chain fatty acid, which gets released. And the percentage of this propionic acid is very, very higher compared to other types like butyrate and etc. This probably what I'm telling is maybe able, some of the parents may be able to understand who, have, who had followed or who are following the name check. But what happens when you are giving this inulin, 
as I've discussed in my slides, and I've shown you the literature also, that inulin being a prebiotic, it influences the growth of both the good and the bad bacteria. That is why those parents who are taking inulin, they might have observed that sometimes the gut is bad and sometimes the gut is good. So they'll be waxing and wearing periods of constipation, diarrhea with healthy gut. And when the gut is healthy, you might feel that the child is also cooperating and behaviors are also better. But when the gut becomes bad, the cooperation level and everything goes down because the toxins releases and goes into the brain. Now, so gut dysbiosis plus defective synaptic pruning is the possible uh, theories or is the possible thing which lands up for the child in ASD. Now, we cannot do anything about this defective synaptic pruning. We, but we can work about gut dysbiosis. So if we are able to figure it out, gut dysbiosis, if we are able to work on the gut dysbiosis, probably we might be able to reduce the symptoms of ASD. At least from moderate, we might bring the child to mild moderate or maybe mild. So this is the whole crux or the whole presentation in one slide. That is whenever there is a maternal immune activation, that is when the mother is during the conceived or during the preconceptual period, uh, antibiotic stress and etc. It can cause the alter in the gut um, bacteria. Then the mode of delivery, whether it is a normal delivery or cesarean, it can affect the gut in the child. And because of that effect in the gut, if there is a lot of release of toxins and SCFAs, what we call, it can cause defective synaptic pruning. Defective synaptic pruning means unwanted connections that are not That is why even a simple sentence given to the child might cause, over, might cause stimming or what we call sensory overload. He might run away. He might not able to listen. So in that case, we start following biscuit trial treatment. Take a cheese, thoda thoda deke bolna hai. Wait, look for the eye contact. So all these pictures can land up into an autism. So this is a brief about how this gut dysbiosis and uh, connection between the gut and the brain. So this is one of my favorite topics in uh, uh, developmental delays, autism, and ADHD. So this was a brief and an overview picture of gut dysbiosis and the connection between the gut and the brain. So uh, thank you, parents. And now we can take up the questions if there are any questions which are there. Hello, sir. Yeah, yeah, hello. Sir, thank you for this explanation. Actually, I was, um, I'm very glad that I could understand more scientifically today. Uh, sir, I uh, I want to know, ki, uh, okay, maybe this, this gut thing is uh, already present, but what as a parent we can help as in diet and regular uh, you know day-to-day uh, -day basis to help yes see uh first of all the first and foremost thing is mm -hmm. i will uh first the junk food you should avoid giving the junk food to your child mm -hmm. give them a lot of fiber diet which can easily make them digest rather than giving junk food Avoid giving too much intake of sweets, especially in the form of maybe ice creams, etc. Now, avoid giving them milk if you feel that once the milk is given, it causes problems in the gut. Because majority of the kids, in my experience, I have seen gluten might not be a problem, but in 90% of the children, casein is a problem. So avoid giving them any product which contains casein. In a simple manner, avoid giving them dairy products which are any dairy product which is prepared from cow, milk, goat, sheep has to be avoided. Now, if I talk about GFCF diet, it cannot be given to every child. There are certain, now this is the thing which you can do as a parent at your level. Now, if these are not resolved, then you require to take a professional guidance where we need to work on what is the level of his gluten intolerance, what is the level of his, uh, uh, I mean, casein intolerance, what is his, the level of yeast intolerance, what is, are the levels of his oxalates and other other parameters. And then accordingly, we need to work on the gut through the diet plan and through the nutritional plan. That is through the use of probiotics or supplements if required or not required. Because mm -hmm. if I'm cutting down on the milk, that is I'm reducing the casein, the mm -hmm. calcium intake might also affect. So we might have seen many times, because they hyperactive, hote hai, sofe se kud gaya, gil gaya. Mm -hmm. uh, autistic child, bachche jo hote hai, they are more prone for fracture, 30 they are more prone for three to four times more prone for fractures than compared to a neurotypical child. Even they just go from a uh, floor, a jump from a house, uh, I mean, through the sofa. Why? Because 
मोस्ट ऑफ देम थ्रू द सोशल मीडिया पेरेंट्स आर कनेक्टेड दे गो फॉर अ जी एफ सी केसिन कट हो गया कैल्शियम इंटेक कम हो गया वैटामिन कम हो गया बोन डेंसिटी कम हो गई फ्रैक्चर्स एकदम होने लग जाते हैं सो वी नीड टू फिगर इट आउट हमको उनसे सप्लीमेंट क्या देने हमने कट डाउन तो कर दिया बट वॉट सप्लीमेंट नीड टू बी गिवेन टू मेंटेन दैट दैट इज वाई प्रोफेशनल गाइडेंस इज रिक्वायर दैट इज वाई डिड नॉट टेल यू दैट दीज थिंग्स हैव टू बी डन एट द लेवल ऑफ द पेरेंट्स फॉर योर लेवल द इनिशियल थ्री थिंग्स विच आर टू थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच सर वन मोर क्वेश्चन सो एज अ प्री प्री बायोटिक और प्रो बायोटिक सो डू वी हैव समथिंग एल्स इन द फूड रेदर देन दिस फाइबर डाइट लाइक सम पीपल सजेस्ट कर्ड एंड ऑल तो क्या वो यस आप कर्ड दे सकते हो बिल्कुल कर्ड दो लेकिन जो देखो आप कर्ड दो लेकिन केजिन नहीं देना ए टू कर्ड दे दो ए टू मिल्क इज केजिन फ्री मिल्क ठीक है बट अगेन इट डिपेंड्स अपॉन हाउ मच सिवियर द प्रॉब्लम इज एंड आई वॉज एज आई टोल्ड यू द गट इज नॉट द गट प्रॉब्लम इज नॉट ओनली रिलेटेड टू द गट की मेरे बच्चे को कॉन्स्टिपेशन नहीं है उसको डायरिया नहीं है उसको ब्लोटिंग नहीं है वो मोशन आराम से जाता है उसकी गट की प्रॉब्लम ही नहीं है बट बिहेवियर बहुत है इमोशन इमोशनल डिसरेगुलेशन बहुत है सुनता नहीं है आई कॉन्टैक्ट नहीं है दो माइट बी द प्रॉब्लम विच यू माइट नॉट फेसिंग इट इन द गट बट हो सकता है उसकी स्लीप डिस्टर्ब हो अनकंट्रोल्ड लाफ्टर हो हमिंग हो दैट आर ऑल्सो द गट प्रॉब्लम सो दैट एज टोल्ड यू दैट गट प्रॉब्लम इज नॉट ओनली रिलेटेड टू दो थ्री टर्म्स कॉमन टर्म्स कॉन्स्टिपेशन डायरी एंड ब्लोटिंग दे आर मच बी ऑन दैट with gfcf diet actually what we observed that he almost uh, lost uh, much weight okay so uh, that actually he lost uh, uh, just a minute ma'am he lost yeah. much weight yes yes almost uh, uh. Yeah, i continued actually almost two months okay but uh, i in the in that two months i almost uh, i lo- he almost lost two two and half kg uh, during that period okay so i consulted with my doctor and i my other therapist also and and also uh, moreover that uh, gfcf diet practice also did not help uh, in, in in his gut issue okay so that time doctor also suggested that go back to the normal diet whatever he used to take okay because when it is not helping in the intention what we started for then it's better to go into the regular diet where at least he was gaining some weight other development was happening okay so that is my main concern that uh, like what we can do like i uh, okay. uh, lot I, of vegetables yeah yeah i got your point ma'am i got your point now first and foremost i'll ask you two questions you were following a gfcf diet so were you giving potatoes in the gfcf diet yes potatoes but you, very less quantity but very then it less. is not then it is not gfc effect were you giving white rice in his diet white rice we are we were given the boiled white rice yes it's not a gfc effect that's what i'm telling see when we talk about gfc of diet gfc of diet doesn't only mean that you avoid gluten and giving casein and most importantly i was telling you uh, just the previous parent has asked when you are giving a gfc of diet we are cutting down on most of the nutrients and as a result the child will land up into loss of weight agitation frustration because you are cutting his important things and good uh, delicious food so the hmm. problem is not on cutting the gfc of diet see if you go on a gfc of diet any person can search on the google you will get the list of gluten and casein free you can start but the problem is what compensatory things you have to give to your child because this is his nutritional growing stage so when you are mm. cutting down on the gluten and casein what extra composition you have to provide to the child so that his nutrition his growth his parameters is not affected that is much much more important than going on a gfc of diet see okay uh, i we have i have lot of parents who were on gfc of diet but ultimately after period of 6 to 7 months they are on normal diet at least 7 to 80% they are taking gluten and casein in their diet and they are doing well so the thing is not going on a gfc of the thing is 
why we want to go on a GFCF diet, that is more important to figure it out. So probably when you were going on a GFCF diet, you find more negatives than positives. Loss of hmm. weight, more agitation, no improvement in his behaviors and other things. Probably you were not focusing or probably your health professional was not focusing why you are following a GFCF diet. So following a GFCF diet is not important. Following it with a rational is important. Hmm. I, either I'm following, either I'm following for because there is an intolerance in my child. What is the level of intolerance? Is there are any yeast issues for which I'm following? Is there any low levels of vitamin B12 which are which are disturbing the absorption of my food in the gut? Should I give the B12? What are the reasons which are affecting my child? That is more important and then follow it meticulously. Okay, okay. So this yeah. uh, intolerance test you are saying, so that will be some medical test can be doable? Like yeah, uh, it is, it, yeah, it is a blood test. It is a blood test. And you can, uh, it is a blood test. For more details, you can get in touch with us or you can drop us an email. We will let you know, but it's a blood test. It's not any other test. It's just a simple blood test, which requires okay. and which gives you a list of different, different levels of parameters of intolerance. Okay, ma'am? Okay, fine, fine. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we'll take up the last question for now because at the anyways at the end of the webinar series we do have a question up session exclusively for this purpose only. So we yeah, can take up the last sir. question. Yeah, please. Good evening, yeah. sir. Uh, Good evening. Can craving for uh, more food be a reason or an indication for gut disturbance? Craving for more food. Now craving yes. for which type of food? Like uh, chapati, bread, biscuit, or oh. rice. Yeah. Now uh, I'll tell you one thing that this is the thumb rule for every child on the spectrum. And uh, uh, I can tell you here itself, if I tell you, uh, there are, uh, if I tell all the parents that out of this, how many parents see, how many parents have observed that whenever you keep a biscuit on the table or you keep some namkeen or you keep some chapati, your child will go as though he's been released from the jail and he just snatches up the chapati and eats it. I believe more than 50% of the parents. But Correct, this thing, but this thing will not happen if a, you if a child is on a neurotypical spectrum. Why? Because the problem which I have discussed in these slides has created some problem, or not problem, has created some scenarios or natural scenarios in the brain. Where in the brain, you know, there are some things what are called as scavengers. You know, like honey or like bee. He uh, scavenges or takes the blood from our skin. Similarly, there are some scavengers in the brain which crave for carbohydrates or gluten. So that is why whenever you keep a gluten diet near your child, he will have a craving as though he want to grab it and no one else should take it. This is because of that problems in the brain of what we call as scavenger issues of what we have discussed in synaptic pruning. So that is called as this uh, issues related to the scavenging. So that is a medical and technical term, forget that. But yes, the, uh, the craving for carbohydrates or craving for these products like beet and etc. is much, much more in children on the spectrum than compared to the neurotypical. And that is related to this related disturbances between the gut and the brain. So for your question, yes, it is related to that thing. And another thing is it is because if your child has been kept on too much GFCF diet without giving him alternatives, then it can also create a problem. As I've told, if you're following a GFCF diet, you might be not giving him milk at all because many parents don't know. They might have saying that, okay, uh, gluten casein free dena to milk nahi dena. So they might not be giving the milk. On the other hand, the child is very fond of milk. He can't sleep without taking the milk. So that will obviously increase the craving for that child. So this is another picture of why the craving happens in children. Either we are putting them on excess restrictive diet. So our concern is to put them on a restrictive diet but what alternatives you are providing to them so that the restriction, that frustration gets reduced. So that is why I told, it's not about stopping the milk. It is stopping about the casein. So if the child is very fond of butter, give him butter, no issues, but give him A2 milk, give him A2 butter. So those are the things. I hope I have answered your question. All right. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, parents. Uh, uh, there are uh, other questions are also there in the chat box. We will take up uh, in the later during the end of our session webinar series. Thank you, thank you parents for joining, thank you.